We are the weirdos, mister. Black as night, erase death from our sight. White as light, mighty hectic, make it right. I myself am strange and unusual. Cast a circle, spark some incense, and grab a glass of wine, because it's time for a special episode of the Cousins Coven podcast. I'm Sharon. And this is Wendy. Welcome back to the Coven, you guys. Welcome to the Lugnasta festivities. Since Wendy and I live so far apart and we can't physically be outdoors together celebrating this Sabbath, we are going to do a little virtual coven landscape, and we're going to escape today into our little imagination. Yay! So I know we always talk about wanting to do outdoor magic together, especially somewhere by water or the ocean. Like, what would your dream location with us together be? It definitely would be on the beach. Yeah. Like, I I can picture it in my head, and it sort of resembles something like in the craft, where we have a nice big bonfire, no people around, just us. Leather jackets. Might have to buy a private island. No. <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> yeah, some of those tiki torches that would be cute in a pentagram shape somehow yeah and then just have no one walk by because they'd be really scared we were doing like satanic rituals (laughs) (laughs) exactly so like if you're flying up above and they're like dude there's a pentagram down there that'd be yes like (laughs) yeah that sounds perfect like i would love to just hear the ocean be under a big moon Maybe some yes. crickets or something nearby and have like a little log or something to sit on with a fire. I think we could have our wine and maybe even some s'mores. Yes. I love it. Maybe some fruit. Oh. oh some chocolate covered yes. strawberries. Yes. I was something. just going to say strawberries. Yeah. Okay. Sounds so Beautiful good. picture. I love it. I love it too. Okay. So let's make it a reality someday soon. Yes. Manifesting <laughs> right now. Yes. Let's do it. So do you, I know you have some stories to share. Yes, just a few. Um, you know, for my sister's birthday, we ended up taking my family, I should say my dad and my sister and my daughter and I, we all went to Saturday Market. And I was really excited because I came across this booth where they sold local Oregon stones. Nice. And I found some stones that I'd never seen before. One was this brown Oregon opal, and it was just so smooth and so beautiful, and I had never seen it. And I was just thinking, I need to talk about this and share. Go to your local Saturday market. Yeah. You might find something cool like a beautiful stone. So is it so I was just super excited. brown like a tiger's eye? No, it's more like a light-colored brown. Mm-hmm. Like almost a tan, tan color. You said it was a Oregon opal. Yeah, Oregon opal. I'm gonna Google it. Yes, do it. So, it's just showing me regular pictures of opal, like the clear one. Yeah. But it's brown. It's not clear. Yeah. It's like a tan color, and it was a solid color. Oh, okay, I think I see. And so it. I guess they, they found them just in the desert area because they're formed by this hot volcanic ash almost kind of like obsidian is mm-hmm. and you know obsidian's really prominent here in oregon because of volcano and um and the opal is kind of that way too so they found it in the desert so these people they go digging around and then they sell them at the saturday market this one listing i found it's showing them in like these very orangey brown reddish hues almost like carnelian i'd say Mm -hmm. and they're claiming that it's like rare and no longer mined um so it's like valuable would you say was it expensive to get or no they charged me a dollar for it nice yeah so it was cheap she had all these great stones um all local to the area so it was really Mm -hmm. nice and I really enjoy that. So uh, do you guys have Saturday markets there? Yeah, and I don't take advantage of them. And we've been talking about going, Wayne and I, so I really would like to. And I'd be happy if I sa- found some freaking stones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've found some great things. Like I got this great strawberry rhubarb pie and some fresh blueberries. Mm-hmm. It's just so lovely. I mm-hmm. did end up getting two stones of my own, though. Um, I-, I went to this oh. place with my friend Maria, who's been on the podcast, episode four. 
on mm -hmm. astral projection if you guys are interested but we went to this like rock and stone fossil place here in San Antonio and they have a good selection of stones and um, I was talking to the owner because it was really slow and she's really attentive and likes to like talk to people and I was like you know what? let me ask her what she thinks about like crystal grids and so I was just like picking her brain on how she does them and she was just talking about how it's really intuitive whenever you do a grid and just like go with the flow and sometimes when she steps back at the end she'll be surprised that she grabbed all like colors or the different themes she does like self-love grids um, grids based on like the zodiac and protection and love for the home and I was like, oh, well, how long do you leave them up or how often do you charge them? And it was just really fun talking to her. And then she was talking about how she uses this stone Amazonite and that it's good for uh. connecting with the water. And I was like, wait, hold up. Mm -hmm. Do you have any of that here? <laughs> and so I went to her little bucket of um, Amazonite and it's like this really pretty like blue teal sea foam color almost. Mm -hmm. And so I got two pieces of that and I was just like, this is perfect. Like I'm every altar I ever has has at least something incorporated with Pisces or the ocean or the water. Um, so I love, I love, love working it. with water. I had to Google search that because I thought I, I do have some of this. I do have a couple of stones of this. So yay. That makes sense. You would have it too, Pisces. I know. <laughs> right. I just felt connected to it. I think I got mine in New Mexico. So yeah, cool. Yay. I'm, that's kind of interesting. What we both great. went stone shopping a little bit. Yeah, I love Yay. it. You've got to have enough stones. I probably have too much. My daughter had to reel me back. She's like, do you actually need those stones? I was like, I need them all. Yeah, I know. Because <laughs> like I was telling the lady, I was like, I don't have that big pieces or like amazing pieces to do like all these crazy grids. So that would mm -hmm. be a goal to have like big pieces of amethyst and clear quartz yes. and just do some badass grids. I just have this one giant block of obsidian that Ooh. I found when I was a child <gasps> in a creek. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, it's huge too. It's probably, I don't know, about the size of a loaf of bread, maybe a little bit bigger than that. Is obsidian the same yeah. as lava rock? Yes, except for it, I think obsidian might be shinier. It's that really shiny black. My mom had some of this stuff too. Yes, she. I saw it. She still has it in her yeah, garden. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, hey, that's just like mine. <laughs> but I found mine in a creek. Um, my dad and I used to make these, like, little dams mm -hmm. in the creek so that we could pool up water so I could try to go mm -hmm. swimming. So we were making these little homemade pool across, and I was like, oh, my gosh, look at this rock. And he's like, take that home. It's worth a lot of money. <laughs> that's interesting. So, I, I, I didn't mm -hmm. know about the properties of obsidian, but I was like raised seeing that always outside in the garden. So it's crazy. Like it's still there to this day. <laughs> still there. Mm -hmm. And they like to soak up the moon um, and they give a nice property of protection. So I've always got it at the front of my house so that or my near my front door somewhere. So it kind of blocks out any negative energy. That is like giving my heart tinkles. I want one. <laughs> <laughs> Good. You need yeah. one. Next time you're here, I'm sure you can Let's find go one. digging around for one. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So I had a couple of experiences too. Really? Um, yes. I'm excited to kind of tell you about this one. Um, it's a little haunting story just a little bit it kind of ties into my past mm -hmm. so my dad um, he had to have surgery this past week and we were in the room waiting for the nurse to come in and kind of get him all prepared for the surgery and he was talking to himself he's like oh there I go talking to myself and then he said something he goes uh, were you my kid that used to sit in the closet and talk to themselves with their imaginary friend. And I said, well, to me, it wasn't imaginary. And this is the first conversation that my dad and I have ever had like this. Yeah. And he says, well, it probably wasn't imaginary. That house was haunted. And I've never heard him say that ever. So the house that I grew up in, he, he, his theory behind it, because I asked him, I was like, well, do you, why do you think that it was haunted? He said, I think that I don't know why it was haunted, but I think that the person that you were talking to wasn't just a ghost. It was a spirit of the house. Huh. That's interesting. So I've, it was real interesting. Okay, that's awesome that you got confirmation from someone who's usually pretty yeah. closed off with that and, and shutting it off, ignoring it. 
and right. that you got confirmation yeah. that he believes you and is and saying, yeah, I know you were talking to ghosts. Um, right. And because so, he's he did. He said I used to sit in there. He said sometimes for three to four hours <gasps> just sitting in my closet with the, and there was no light in there. So I would sit in there with the door closed. I'm kind of shook and bring all my toys in and just sit in there. And you enjoyed it. Yeah, and talked to whoever I was talking Did to. Did you see them, or were you guys in the dark and you just heard his voice? I, in my memory, how I remember it is that there was another person there with me, and we weren't in the dark. Mm -hmm. I always had a light. It, it always looked light to okay. me. Okay, maybe it was like light pouring in, or you adjusted to it. I don't know if there's anything yeah, else going on. I have so many freaking questions, as I always do. And I'm actually kind of scared <laughs> because literally I've always been afraid of closets. Oh, Hearing no. you talk about this, I'm thinking in my mind, like, something akin to the sixth sense when he was talking to those, like, scary ghosts in his tent, like, at night as a kid. Like, I freaking hate closets. And you weren't scared, though. I wasn't scared because <sighs> it came to me, whatever it came to me as was a child. Okay, that was going to be my next question. So, yeah, would, would you describe, yeah. like, what it, he lo it looked like, boy, girl? So, it was a little boy, and he called himself Christopher. Mm -hmm. And he had kind of sandy blonde hair and was my size. We were, like, the same age, or maybe he was a year older than me. Mm-hmm. But now that I think about it, I think that as I aged, he aged, so it couldn't have been a ghost, right? So what did your dad mean by house spirit or spirit of the house? He thought spirit of the house. He feels that that house had its own, that it was alive itself, I guess. That's what, I'm, that what he was trying to say. Yeah. So, yeah, he was like, I regret not buying it. He goes, I think about that <gasps> house all the time. So he liked it? And he liked it and he didn't want anybody else to have it is what he was telling me in the room when we were waiting he was like telling me how he wished that he would have bought it and that he didn't want anybody else to have it he's like now that spirit is with somebody else and not us and he, what, what the <coughs> heck? excuse me i am so surprised by that right my dad who's who's so christian he would never talk about that really he never acknowledged the ghosts when i was growing up to my face anyways mm -hmm. so it is kind of interesting i guess wow do you want to give like a refresher of types of paranormal activity you had for maybe listeners yes so for those yeah. of you yeah for those of you who don't know so i would see full-on apparitions they would move objects these ghosts would talk to me they would show themselves to me and it was more than one entity um i had an indian that was there uh something that kind of reminded me of a knight in shining armor but i don't necessarily know that's what he was that's just what my little kid brain saw it as there were two black dogs um wow. i also saw these flashing lights that would just bounce down the hall and I would chase them, or I, I shouldn't say down the hall. We had. Do you got? Do you know what a shotgun house is? I Have you ever seen don't one of those? Know. It's kind of like they they're very prominent, I think, in the Louisiana okay. area. So basically, you walk in and then you go from that room to the next room to the next room. They're all kind oh, of like connected. Oh, like little archways. Yeah, and so that's how this house mm -hmm. was. And so basically, if you were in the kitchen, you could see from the kitchen all the way to the to the living mm -hmm, room mm -hmm. door that went outside. And so I remember chasing lights, bouncing lights, different colors um, from the front door into the kitchen. And then they went through what I considered to be a vortex into this thing and they disappeared, <sighs> which is what we thought was in between. Well, my mom, I should say, my mom and I thought that there was potentially this vortex in between the dining room and the kitchen. Mm -hmm, right. Because you, whenever you went through there, you could feel it just it's hard to explain, but it kind of felt like, you know, when you get your leg falls asleep and it's on pins and needles, it felt like that. But all through your body, from your head to your toes. So that was kind of some of the activity. Right. And I felt like I had premonitions while I was there and and felt the energy of everything around me. I so, wonder yeah. if that house ever comes up for sale, like if you ever looked it up recently. Um, yeah, I look it up all the time. Actually, I have it saved. There's this feature on um, 
Zillow. You can save mm -hmm. a house. If it ever comes up for sale, it will notify mm -hmm. you. So I do have that saved. Um, and it's been with the same people since we left. So. Wow. I, you should totally go pull an Ed and Lorraine Warren and knock on their door. <laughs> experience, you know. Have you seen Christopher? Any haunting activity? Yeah. Was it just me? Have you seen my friend Christopher? Right? <laughs> Did you see these dogs? I'm just curious because they didn't follow me. <laughs> right. So do you yeah. have more to elaborate on in your closet ventures with Christopher? Like, what would you guys talk about? I don't really know. I think sometimes he would show me images. And I think I've talked about that before, where sometimes I can't always hear what a ghost says, but they will show me images. In your brain, you just kind of get flashes? Not really in my brain. It's more like, like I'm watching a movie. <laughs> so like I can look at something, say a <gasps> wall, and there's and there's the images Holy on the shit. wall. That's um, so cool. sometimes they are in my head, but for the most part, it's not in my head. That is like a type of claromancy kind of thing, right? To be able to see. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I didn't know that at the time, obviously. we I'm only learning out about that stuff yeah. now. Um, wow. What would he yeah. want to show you? So, stuff about his life? No, he wanted to show me past, present, and future of the world. So it's kind of like he was a guide. So I don't know if he was my spirit guide, maybe. But my dad thought it was the spirit of the house, obviously, that, after that conversation we oh, just wow. had. Oh, wow. Okay, so... That means that your dad was privy to more than he ever shared, and it's you, and like right. now that you are going to be spending some time with him, yeah, since events, he's had a yeah, surgery, you could have maybe some opportunities yeah. to, to figure out what else he knows. Because how did he right. get the example, or not the example, the impression of him being this the house of the spirit? Like he had to have had right. something significant happen with Christopher to know he's wise or more powerful than just an apparition. Sure. Ooh. Yeah. Good questions. Yeah. I'll have to delve yes. into that a little bit more. Because yes. <laughs> this is the same house that you guys thought that there was activity in the basement as far as rituals, right? Yes. Same house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Forgot about forgot about the cult that I thought potentially yeah. lived there before yeah. us. <laughs> wow. So interesting, right? Yes. Give me a little goosebumps here. <laughs> <laughs> And as if that weren't enough, I have one other story. Are you serious? Okay. <laughs> so um, at work this past week, I was, you know, typing away at my computer. <laughs> Every time I tell tell a story like that and I'm typing away at my cute computer, do you know those videos of the cat <laughs> where they're just slapping on yeah. the keyboard? <laughs> That's the motion that I always make when I tell people I'm typing on the computer. I love that visual. <laughs> <laughs> so just type it away on the computer <laughs> and uh i see a flash from the corner of my eye and i look out this big window that we have kind of sitting across from me in the office and i see this flash of light that's coming from this cloud this white cloud and i'm like what the heck why is that cloud flashing is it just flashing to me is it flashing in general what's going on and then a piece of the cloud kind of separated and shot up into the air just straight up like like a beam of light what the hell? shot up into the air i can't and i was I like can't. <laughs> <laughs> i was just like that must be a ufo and i'm like okay think with your rational brain wendy and just sit here for a second and think with your rational brain and let's do some research and see what this could be and it comes to find out that this potentially was cloud lightning mm. so and i had no idea that this existed but we had been having a lot of lightning in our area this summer um, which is kind of unusual for oregon we get some thunderstorms but not like this we've had them week after week like pretty much once a week we've had some tornadoes we've had some full-on trees knocked down so it wasn't anything new for me to learn that it potentially was lightning just because of the fact that two days maybe not even two days before the day before there had been a, a tornado in portland what and so you know that we had tornadoes I know. yeah i didn't i mean it, they just happened very very rarely we did have a tornado and so apparently the the cloud collects all of the lightning and rather than shooting it across the sky or shooting it to the ground it shot up out of the cloud and into 
the air, and it made the clouds around it dissipate and disappear. Okay, so this was not an alien. It was not an alien. It was a weather <sighs> phenomenon. So I guess my point of it was just to say, before you get all excited that you saw a UFO, check your stuff. Right? Because I really was going to lose my shit if you were told me that that was a UFO. I wish it was. I, <laughs> I wish w- it I was. was. Like, no, because my no. initial... Yeah. Whew. My initial thought, my alien loving brain was like, it's happening. This is it. It's finally, it's just coming out. They're all going to be here. They're going to come. This is like something I've seen on a video game or something, <laughs> the way it shot up straight up <laughs> into the air. I'm like, this is it. No, lightning. Yeah. Just a rare lightning that I've never seen before. That's pretty cool, though, in and of itself. Yeah. That's what I thought, too. Yeah. I was like, wait a second. Mother Nature, I love you. Yeah, there's something about <laughs> storms and thunder like that I love that Absolutely. always empower me, and I'm yeah. like, yes, mm-hmm. I love them. Me too. Usually, I can feel that stuff coming too. I don't know if you get that where you'll get the initial goosebumps. Ooh, like I get no. static electricity that forms around on the top of my head that I can feel, and I'm like, we're gonna have some thunder and lightning. And the kids are always like, Mom, look outside. It's not gonna happen. And then, and then it usually happens. Damn, weather goddess premonitions. That's amazing. <laughs> well, you have to let us know if it's going to rain tonight since we're under the moon. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, I really love oh. your stories. Thanks for all of that. You're welcome. Uh, Hopefully they were entertaining hell enough. yes. Oh, my God. That ghost <laughs> update, honestly, that was everything. <laughs> It was the greatest. So I guess we should mention to you guys, today we really intended to just hang out here on the beach and have a little witchy palooza. So we just want to talk about, you know, witchcraft, what deities we've been inspired by lately, different witch questions we could answer, tips, lifestyle. But first, we really wanted to dive into Lugnasta. So I can't ever say it right. Windy, educate us. <laughs> <laughs> what is this holiday? I'm going to educate. I'm going to educate myself. <laughs> so when I first saw the word, I was like, Sharon, I don't know that I can pronounce this mm-hmm. word. And then it came out as Lugnasta. And then I guess I read, or you mm-hmm. read, that it was also, it could be Lamas. And then I read in the Irish kind of folklore that it would be pronounced Luness. Mm, which is the prettiest one so far. Right. <laughs> and then I guess it happens every August 1st. It's the halfway point between summer and autumn. I kind of found out that it was mostly an Irish-Scottish celebration, that that's where it started out as and there's this Irish mythology that said that they would worship or recognize the god Lu. Oh, I don't know if I'm saying yes. it right or if it's coming across L-U-G-H yeah. so I got excited because I yeah. was like totally I've read about him I ha- I didn't even know he existed but what I was really excited about was that he also comes from the same tribe as leprechauns that I was talking remember that episode we did of the leprechauns Mm -hmm. and I said they come from the tribe the Tuatha de Danon Mm -hmm. they all come from this same little tribe so Lug is the god of of I had no idea of that connection I had no idea either especially since I had never heard of him and he was just this warrior and kind of a savior to them so cool yes and so the Irish Scottish people would kind of worship him and they would also do things like, or I guess I should say when, when Lunasan, that's what I'm going to call it because it's a little bit easier for me to say mm-hmm. it, if you guys don't mind. So when they started celebrating Lunasay, they really started it as a competition where it was like these games, they would do these games and these athletes would come and it was kind of not like a fight to the death but it was close to that and it was kind of in remembrance of people who had died so kind of like highland games meets dio de los muertos kind of thrown together initially that's how it started out so they'd have these feasts and it would be a feast for a funeral okay and that kind of thing interesting right and then it kind of morphed into other things later later on but it did start out just as this fun but also morbid, almost kind of ceremony. But then once it turned into, we're celebrating between the halfway point between summer and autumn, then they started 
celebrating with the first cutting of the corn. And then they would also take bilberries, all the corn that they had cut down at a bowl, and they would go up to the top of this mountain where they would sacrifice a bowl, bury the food, eat the meat of the bowl, and use the bull hide in a ceremony. And then they would um, do this all for like luck and prosperity, and it would be this grand three-day celebration, and everybody would take place into the celebration. So I thought that was really interesting too. But now today, like in today's society, we celebrate stuff like hand fasting and we do feasting and fairs. And it's also said to be a really good time for you to visit the holy wells. And for those of you who don't know what a holy well is, it's kind of like this supernatural healing well. And I guess during that time that the properties of the wells are more prominent, I should say. I so. am super intrigued by those wells. Yes, me too. I want to go yes, so yes. bad. Okay, dreams right now. Um, yes, I want to go to these wells because when my sister Tabitha and I were Ouija boarding with my our, our grandparents, like Grandpa yes. spelled this weird name. I forgot what it was because it's a different language. But when my, I think my sister Tabby found it, she was googling it and it came up as one of these wells. And it was over Dang, in Europe. We should really and go I there. I was just like, whoa, what is he talking about? Like. And I just was like, ever since then, I wanted to go. And when you Google it, it's this beautiful well. It's old as hell. And <laughs> that rhymed. And then there's like <laughs> little um, ribbons tied in the trees, like little white ribbons. And so it's just really magical looking. Nice. And the idea that there's all of these wells that are considered holy all over. I bet there's such magical properties there. Probably. Oh, my gosh. Could you imagine? I'm just imagining it now. I'm like, how would this be for beautiful. us? Beautiful. These two... It would just be so amazing. We could meditate there. We could just right. I mean, I just hope that there's still water in yeah. it. Yeah, and I mean, oh. water. Like we, we every a lot of the stuff we research into lately for this podcast just talks about how water is so powerful and it's like a, a portal yes. to other dimensions and worlds. And so, if you're a believer of, of what, mm-hmm. the kind of stuff we are, like witchcraft, paranormal, Bigfoot's traveling through freaking portals, like things <laughs> like water, yeah. just seems so magical to me. Like if if there is magical energy in a place, that place has a ton. I love it. I hope we get Dude, to do that. Me too. I really want to go to like the witchcraft museum. I think it's in Cornwall, I want to say. Oh yeah. Love to see Stonehenge. Yeah, I feel like we might have talked about that one yeah. time. I want to go mm-hmm. to the ancient Ram Inn. Like, yes. <laughs> we got to. We're going to have to take this whole European paranormal vacation. <laughs> oh my gosh, Rampings. there's our next idea. Yeah. <laughs> we're just going to, this is our, we're going to be European paranormal vacation, like what are those people called who give the vacations? We'll have our own oh, tour guide company. Oh, there you go. We need to go start a GoFundMe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. I'm sorry I broke you off on that tangent. No, I'm all done. That was basically it. But basically, it's a good time to go to the wells. And I I didn't really have very many other things. What do you have about it? Do I you... Actually, that is all new information. And that's really cool because that helps me appreciate oh. this holiday even more. Like when I was telling you about it, I was like, I don't really quite understand what it is. So that actually helped mm-hmm. me. I do have some rituals oh, in my good. book of shadows that I, I would like to do research um, in the beginning of my wicked, I guess, journey, I should say, witchcraft journey. And so I have some notes on it that I, I remember doing this ritual for the god Lug, I guess how we pronounce it. And he's kind of like a god of craftsmanship and skill. So when you're working with him, you can kind of ask him to help you whatever you're working on. Well, if you're an artist nice. or you are a musician kind of thing, he can, can help you hone that and stay focused on it. And so I I really like that as far as a ritual because I feel like any time in life, when I'm being creative, I'm happy. So to work with a God who's good at helping you like hone your skill, that's what we need. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I really didn't know anything about him. And you say lug, so I guess I immediately thought it was Luke because of... You're probably right. That's how you say it. Which is kind of how... I mean, Luke Nasta. Yeah, it's L-U-G-H. And Luke... Yeah, so, so the it's same. like he's the god of this holiday. I just am super bad at pronouncing these things. Yeah. And I've... You're so good Me at too. it, though. I love it. No, I feel horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I don't do it right. Yeah, and then like when you said that he was a god of like these fae type creatures and leprechauns, mm-hmm. like the yes. photo I have of him in my book of shadows is very Celtic warrior, buffed, big man. So I don't nice. know if that's accurate. So just like okay. him. Yeah, that would be accurate. Everything I did research on for the Tuatha Dé Danann was these kind of warrior 
hot looking dudes with big muscles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm just like, and I'm just going to imagine them beyond the hills now for the festivities. Yes, exactly. Uh, it would be so nice to have a little festival to go to. Oh, maybe you'll find one near right? your area. <laughs> I know we don't usually have them here, so. Which is surprising. Oregon would be such a beautiful location yeah. for outdoor paganism. Might have to start that up. <laughs> <laughs> ideas, ideas. Yeah. So I did find some fun questions um, online for us to read or to answer, I should say. Yes. I'm excited. Uh, yeah, I, I know. I ha- I was trying to think, okay, where could I go for inspiration? And there's this tag going around. I think it's like, get to know me, the witchy tag or something like that. And so I picked a nice. few of those questions, and I know we added a couple of our own. But the first yes. one, some of our listeners may already know the answer to this, but I think it's always fun to talk about. So do you think that you have natural gifts such as premonitions, hearing spirits? And if so, do you think that is what led you to this witch path? Ooh, that is a good question. And yes. For me, I feel like I do have some natural gifts. Definitely. We've um, heard some of those today. <laughs> we kind of established yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and do I think it's led me to this path? Maybe. I still feel like I may, might have been born already on this path. Right. And you were born with these powers. Yeah. Born with this mm-hmm. stuff um, just right under the surface. So what about you? What would you say for um, you? Opposite, I guess because I didn't have premonitions as far as I know. I, I never heard spirits as far as I know. I was afraid of closets, so <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> never talked to anybody <laughs> had fun in them with them. Um, so for me, that's something that's happening now as I start meditating, as I start getting more spiritual, as I start being more aware of my surroundings and looking into nature and looking into all this weird stuff. Like, I got into witchcraft first and then I feel like Mm -hmm. those kind of abilities slowly slowly are happening well maybe they were just dormant inside of you I I don't disagree with that because I feel like that's I think everyone has those type of abilities that are I think we all have the possibility of it just at varying degrees and levels exactly yeah very great question so I'll read the next one if you're Mm -hmm. ready what is your favorite incense scent for magical purposes okay so I feel like I have like a, a couple I could say. <laughs> I yes, go really for it. love florally incense, which I think a lot of people wouldn't like, but I love yeah. rose scented things. And I feel like. Oh, I love rose scented too. I just feel like it's so transformative. And I know it's good for love and I think cleansing as well and purifying a space. Mm-hmm. And it, I really love just to smell kind of like nature y things. Uh, I feel like. Nice. Rose has to be really feminine too and, and associated with like God, this type energy. But aside right. from that, like you recently sent me some incense. Yes, my favorite one white sage. Yes. So tell us about that one. So, white sage incense, it's just the same kind of properties as the sage sticks, but without all that. You know how sometimes after a sage stick, it's got that burnt smell mm-hmm. afterwards. So you lose all of that when you're using the incense. And I use it quite often. So to cleanse a space, my favorite my second favorite would be lemongrass I just came across this one for the first time and I feel bad I didn't search up to see what it would be good for but I guess citrus kind of brings happiness yeah right? and like cleansing as well yeah cleansing and happiness mm-hmm. so those would be my two my top two go to awesome I I don't ever like tend to lean into lemon but you like the white sage ones that you sent me i wanted to say i also really freaking love those and i guess that was like a bonus one that came with it or you picked it out with it because it was the aruda incense came with it did you pick that out i didn't that's awesome so good and they're um actually made in india uh with a blend that enhances the person's aura and it's also known as the sacred herb of sundays i just really really like these they're called aruda a-r-r-u-d-a okay nice yeah i didn't even know that that's yeah, so, so i was cool. literally have one lit right now so it smells so good very nice yeah um, our next question is how do you raise energy before rituals or spell work for me it's always meditation mm-hmm. i guess i can't stress that enough i even meditated today i think we were kind of talking about that but just that meditation it kind of lets you let go of all the all the things that are bothering you so that you can focus on 
not just a spell, but maybe what you need to work on at that moment. And I just have to say, you're really good at meditating. Like, just Thank you can you. do a long time, and I don't know if that's like something you had to do to endure having such crazy powers as you do and extrasensory abilities. Right. I think so, yeah. actually. <laughs> I Meditation is newer for me, so I'm going to be on a slower road to that. For me, when I, I sure. raised energy before rituals, um, I when I began, I literally had to do energy play exercises where you like rub your hands together and pull them back and kind of feel mm -hmm. like a ball between your hands. And I used to have mm -hmm. to play with that. And then I got to the point where I could just like, I try to focus on those grounding techniques where you just... Uh, connect to the earth and then pull that energy up and I used to have to take my time mm -hmm. and do like a lot of deep breathing to get that done and it's gotten to the point now where I kind of connect more to the spirit power like my ancestors and spirit guides or whatever gods or goddesses I'm working nice. with so I'll just like kind of like either look up or like flex my hands out and then boom I just feel sparks of energy like it's like boom instant <laughs> and nice. it's really cool that's that's so awesome. See, that's a gift. And that was probably a natural dormant gift inside of you. Oh, thank you. I just figured it came from the practice because it was a slow burn, man. It started with having to force that mm -hmm. friction and, and feel it to, to <laughs> being like flame yeah. on. <laughs> nice. Now you're like a superhero for witches. I try. I try. <laughs> <laughs> um, our next question I actually thought was really cute is if someone was attempting yes. to summon you, name three objects they would need. Okay, so hmm, for me, I think it would be a seashell, ocean water, and something purple. <gasps> I love all of those things. Yes. That's so cute. I love it. What about you? I feel like I would really like offerings of like dark chocolate. Like if you put that in your pentagram Ooh. circle, I'd be super down. Um, you could probably summon me with like a copy of the craft on DVD <laughs> with the chocolate next to it. And I'll be like, oh girl, I'm coming. <laughs> and then the third one, ooh, the third one, honestly, if you just like drew the pentagram on the floor or wrote it on a piece of paper and then put those things on top of it, I think that would be perfect. Yeah. You do I love do. the pentagram. You do love I that do. star shape. But you know yeah. what? Water elements as well. What am I thinking? Anything water like, like you said, being a Pisces. Yeah. It's really hard because yeah. uh, that was mm -hmm. a hard one. <laughs> yeah. It's a hard one, but it's very mm -hmm. good. It's a very good question. It's, it's very a cute insightful. question. Yeah. Like, I think they should ask you these questions when you're interviewing <gasps> for a job. Hell yes. <laughs> Not like, what do you see yourself in five years? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> but I do know how to summon you. <laughs> You're like still yeah, right? alive. <laughs> you I can't know, tell you <laughs> breathing. Where I really see myself being a witch. <laughs> yeah, not yeah, working. Exactly. <laughs> Living in the woods, hopefully <laughs> self-employed. <laughs> yeah, self-employed, just doing the things that I want to do. Exactly. Taking down the man. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh. Okay, so next question is. What deities, if any, do you work with? I actually started off with just being basic and working with the god and goddess generically and thinking of the sun and the moon. Mm -hmm. And I probably did that for a couple of years because I wasn't called to a god or goddess. I didn't have a, a specific one I was wanting to, to work with and I didn't want to force it. Sure. I think maybe two, three years into doing magic and rituals, I was doing some automatic writing about a story I wanted to have and all of a sudden it was just like this god had to be a part of the story um it was it's like a fantasy story about witches and magic of course and I wanted to just just brainstorm on it and so this god inserted himself and was like you know what I think that you should make me in here and it was Pan which is like a, the horn god and so I was really up into yeah. Wicca um and they're really into the horn god figure who goes by many names like Cernanos or Pan and whatever horn god you could think of. He's like a god of the wild, mm -hmm. the forests, the hunt, protector of animals, um, nature. And so whenever I would do magic, I would have a gold candle to represent the god. And that's just kind of transformed now to be Pan. So he's like this god I just think nice. of as, as really cool male energy. He's definitely like a sexual god, but I feel like that's kind of cool. Um, I didn't choose him. I feel like he called to me and I'm down. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I love that. And with the goddess, I, I 
play around with different goddesses, but I don't have a solid connection like that. Um, I do like working with Yamaya since she is an ocean goddess. And uh, mm -hmm. recently I've gotten into Hecate. She's like the goddess of witches and witchcraft. And that, of course, appealed to me. Yes. She's like a, a triple-headed yeah. goddess. Um, so sometimes you'll see her represented as three, which I've talked about the power of three and trinities, made mother crone, all the symbolism right. with that. I mm -hmm. love trinities. And she likes it when you do magic on the crossroads. She's like a protector of God, or not gods, dogs. And kind of like a, a paranormal goddess. Like she, I think she's either kind of like an underworld type goddess or she helps ghosts cross through the crossroads. Um, but anyway, I've done rituals at the crossroads by my house. Cause I live like, my apartment complex is behind a, a, a park. And so I've like taken some stuff to that little crossroads and was burning it. And I was like trying not to get caught. So by, like, awesome. The cars driving by and literally these neighbors who are out in their front yard. But I'm all like really just wanting to get into the world and do magic, which is not something I, I do enough of. That's so cool. Yay, I love, I love working with different deities. What about you? I, I don't um, work with deities per se. I pull all of my energy from the universe because I'm so connected to the stars and that dark deep mm -hmm. space that I'm always pulling energy from the universe and mm -hmm. angels I think that's what I've been working with recently so I feel like always the universe and sometimes angels awesome and when you envision the universal energy do you just think of like a loving space kind of thing yeah a loving unending it, like that's got unending energy it mm -hmm. never ends like and it can also the universe when i imagine it can also take things from me that i don't want or need anymore so that it can dispose of mm -hmm. it correctly so i don't know if that makes sense but that's kind of how we're kind of this force that works together and recycling i really yeah. like it because you're like super out of this world and cosmic and then I'm more like grounded with these little <laughs> gods and paganists. <laughs> it's great. It's great. Yeah, you both are great. Different so, approaches. Yeah. Um, it just goes to show everybody's differences and how we can really learn to love each other from those differences. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you ever share like what types of angels you work with or not? You don't like to share that. Um, no, I don't think it's for me to kind of talk about. I can tell you that I kind of mentioned it in a previous episode when I was talking about the Enochian mm -hmm. magic. I did some kind of trans writing and they spoke to me. One in particular spoke to me and I think it was Michael, which we kind of have talked about Michael before with, um, oh, who was it? With Vinny yeah, probably. That's right. I think she talked mm -hmm. about Michael. Yeah. And so if you guys haven't listened to that episode. Our crystals episode? Uh, when we had... Yeah, crystals and shadow yeah. people. So um, Michael came to me and he gave me a list of 42 angels. And some of them were a little bit cryptic. So it were angel names that I had never mm -hmm. heard of before. But I feel like that's the, that's the only thing close that I've had to what you have with your experience with Pan. That's awesome. Um, that's so cool. Yeah, so he came to me. It's really different yeah. when something comes to you, like channeling. And right? I feel like that's the yeah. kind of magic that the Golden Dawn did every time. You know what I mean? Like, I'm right. into that. Like, invoking is yeah. serious shit. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. And I feel like when I'm invoking, sometimes I don't even know that I'm doing it. I just, I think it comes second nature. And I think that I've been doing it so long, thanks to my old ancient <laughs> lifestyle <laughs> that um that i feel like i've probably been doing it for most of my life without even realizing that's what i was doing that's badass yeah okay, so the next question kind of has to do with this and i wanted to talk about what what are our ideas or what do you like to do for leaving offerings for deities elementals fairies ancestors angels the cosmos like what do you do you like to do offerings at all i have yeah i typically go for beverages mm -hmm. for some reason totally. so it's usually like wine sparkling cider i've left flowers um mm -hmm. stones and drawings oh awesome i've never done a drawing i never i don't know why but something just told me to do it a couple of times mm -hmm. so yeah what a creative energy to be working with that's beautiful thank you what about you 
Um, for sure, like libations, uh, wine, rum, mm-hmm. I believe. That that's kind of more when I'm working with like gods and pagan elements, just like the water, earth, air, fire, and things like that. Sure. Um, and if I'm working with like fairies or fey folk during like midsummer and stuff, uh, they like berries and shiny things. Um, with mm-hmm. with ghosts and stuff like that. I remember when I went to the haunted hotel, I left flowers. And nice. with ancestors, I have done weed and <laughs> wine. Okay. And I feel like when you're doing ancestors, it's fun to try to think like, what did that person like? You know. Right. So, right. like, do, do they have a favorite food or a cookie or a drink or this or that? Mm-hmm. And it's kind of fun to do it differently. And like with even different gods, like what would this type of a love goddess like? Or what would this water goddess like, you know? So when you contacted grandpa, did you leave out, you know, like a harmonica and some sweets for him? Because he absolutely loved sweets. I guess that's what I would think of. So did you leave something out for him when you contacted him or? At that time. You were just doing the Ouija, so. It was just the Ouija. There wasn't an offering. And you know what? Gotcha. I never thought about doing an offering with the Ouija and now that makes a thousand percent sense. I've done it with the Ouija before. Oh, so. What do you do? I usually, like I said, I've left the same things. Okay. Like I've left flowers before. Mm-hmm. I've left drinks mm-hmm. somewhere in my circle. It's kind of weird. Like I've learned to always be in a circle. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, for sure. So when I'm doing it, I kind of put candles up all around in a circle around me and then get in the middle of the circle <laughs> and then I'll have all the offerings inside the circle. One time I fell asleep so. in a circle of candles because I was trying to astral for them or meditate. I, and it was not nice. a good idea. I don't recommend it. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but it's kind of cool at the same time that you shouldn't. Yeah, I, I don't remember. I don't think it was astral project because that wasn't it. I was just trying to meditate and I was listening to like a guided meditation and I guess I was so tired and high I just fell asleep. I was like, if I had tossled, my hair would have caught fire or... <laughs> right. Or you'd stretch out your leg and you accidentally knock one over and yeah. no apartment. <laughs> that should be our next question. Fire safety and witchcraft. <laughs> right. <laughs> Always have a fire extinguisher. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, okay. want to ask the next one? Yes. Yeah. So, what is... What do you like most about witchcraft? Ooh, everything. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Man, I love I love so much about witchcraft, but for me it is a spiritual thing and it right. is it's so deep to me and it's so personal to me that I, I love the gift that it gives me and I feel like it gave me the gift of confidence, control in my crazy life, um, control over my own brain and my emotions, learning so much about myself and how to heal my past traumas like, Witchcraft has been like therapy for me and given me control in this world of chaos. I guess that's honestly what I have to say. And it, and it makes me feel super connected. I, I, I don't know. It's so hard to put into words. But... That's actually amazing and deep. It gave me goosebumps. <gasps> oh, thank I really you. <laughs> love that. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. What about you? How would you think about it? I think I like that there's no labels on it. Mm-hmm. So you may be sitting down to do a spell that you've written yourself and you can do whatever you want if you're not going to call on the four corners you don't have to if you're if you want to you can so it's interchangeable and that's what I like is that I can make it what I want and make it how I want Mm -hmm. exactly I really like that exactly that's what I don't know what I love about it it's not just one book that we're pulling from and one right. god that we're pulling from like you don't even have to work with a god you do whatever you it's infinite right yeah so infinite so it's allowing you to stretch and flex your muscles as a witch as a person as a human as right. a spiritual light being whatever you know it's so powerful yeah it's amazing yay for witchcraft those were some good questions yeah. like really deep good questions yeah <laughs> I really thought it would take us like five minutes to answer those. (laughs) (laughs) No, they're so good. (laughs) They're so so good. Everybody should be answering these. So like if you guys 
decide that you hear the question and you want to share your experience with us, please feel free. I would love, I know I would love, I'm sure Sharon would love to hear your answers to these questions. Yeah, maybe we could post them below or uh, in a place yeah. where they're writing so you can see it. But yeah, feel free to email us. Love it. Um, well, we're going to see what else we can get through today because it is our witchy palooza. So yeah. I really wanted to share some stuff that I was reading recently about Odin. Nice. I have been doing runes for a while but i never even knew that odin was the discoverer of them like it's just kind of like when you get tarot cards and you're just like oh there here's some cards to tell the future but you don't really get all the backstory of where those came from the hermetic order the golden dawn and all that mm -hmm. so it's crazy that i never knew this i almost feel like i was stupid for not knowing this stuff <laughs> no no it's a learning process the same as life it is there's so much on all components with with histories of magic and the occult yeah so this one book that i was reading was saying that there's this theory that odin was actually based on this historical real person and just like after his death the legend went on and he became like known as god and i really think that is super powerful especially as a pagan person who prays to deities like it's super cool to think about well what if hecate and freya and pan they were all just real people who were just passed on as legends like i think that's more powerful than thinking of them as mythological creatures Sure. And so for people who don't really know too much about Odin, the basics are he's just, you know, a fair skinned man with a beard. He's usually depicted wearing like these long mage robes. He has a big staff and he has one blue eye and the missing eye is sometimes like hidden behind like a patch or a hat. And he's known as the all father, the wisdom keeper, the wanderer and the wizard. And one thing I found out is that like Gandalf, from the Lord of the Rings, J. I'm gonna say J. K. Rowling, J. R. R. Tolkien, he based <laughs> Gandalf on Odin. Oh my gosh, who knew? I didn't know that either. So I thought that was really cool because he's like it the is. embodiment of what it is to be a wizard, and it turns out Odin is the OG wizard all along. <laughs> nice. And s well, that makes sense. I feel like with gods and goddesses that there are all these names out there but some of them may be the same person yeah for sure that's definitely yeah. how it feels like because it's like the same type of god but is depicted in multiple cultures it means they're real by the way if all these different cultures have the same story about these different gods and goddesses then those gods and goddesses were real they just right? called them what they wanted to call them right yeah it's like any kind of religious text with uh, yeah like if you look at the Quran and Muhammad, like that was probably, mm -hmm. that definitely was a real person, but maybe he just has yeah. like, in the book you have these legends that might be depicting things larger than life, who knows? Right. So right. who's to say exactly. Odin wasn't just a man and it got super out of hand with these legends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's all the way to a god. But, so I don't know. So this is what I found out more about Odin is that he was kind of portrayed as a healer, a teacher. He was even a shaman. And he's a practitioner of Seder. And he learned it from Freya, who's a goddess as well. And she, of course, may have been a real person herself, but I didn't really look into her as much. But I did find out that Freya is basically this divine archetype of the vulva. Vulva are these female Nordic shaman, basically. It's what they call the females who are witches and shamans. And so I got super like, oh my gosh, I have to go find out about vulva. And I got super into this. <laughs> um, and they practice this Seder. That's like the type of magic that they practice. Oh. And so they're basically just trying to discern what is the fated course of their life events. And they're trying to symbolically weave new events into being. So they're manifestors. And to do that, the practitioner would go into these trances and they would sing like songs and work with spirits and travel into these other worlds just to get their tasks accomplished. So it sounds very much like what we're doing to this day. And Odin took part in this, and so did a small number of men. Um, he became, not a vulva, but they call him, he, he just practiced satyr. And so for men to do this, they would actually kind of get made fun of and looked down on because it was considered a female act to do this and be a vulva, and you would have to wear a dress just like them, so that's probably why he's depicted in those robes. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of mm -hmm. interesting for me to think of Odin as such a humble man that he doesn't care that it's like, to make it's not going to boost uh, his reputation. It might make people look down on him. He doesn't care. He's going to go hang with these women and learn their ways. Mm -hmm. So that made me super happy. Um, and the vulva were, were real. You know, maybe Odin wasn't real. Maybe he wasn't. But for sure, vulvas are real. And there's archaeological evidence of this. And they would wander from town to town and all these different farms. And they would just like give people prophecies. 
and they would do different magic for people and they would just kind of like use trade like okay we'll do this for you if you can offer us room and board or some food and I thought that was super super intriguing like I wanted to know everything like what were their rituals right <laughs> spell it out for me yeah exactly and I ended up getting a book on Icelandic magic that was kind of recommended if you were into this type of thing uh, so I'm excited to learn more about that and I'm not sure if it's exactly what the Volvas did but I'm like super going down this road <laughs> so That's today so I'm just cool. gonna exactly right I was like this is like Germanic magic so I'm kind of feel like it's in our blood it's in our family you know yeah. And I found out the societies, they would kind of look at them and, and fear them, but they were also would hold them in like like high regard. Like people feared the magic, I guess, but they also wanted it and they really thought it was awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and that the cool. some of the archaeological evidence of them is that they were found, they found some like, I think it was two Volvo skeletons, I guess you could say, buried in this ornamental boat. And inside the boat, they saw their magical objects like a staff and wands. They had these really cool ornate tiara crowns on. They had these really luxurious like robes and garments. So this is like the best kind of barrel you could have back then. And there was even gold in there. And so for the town people to do that, that it was like better than royalty kind of thing. And so the Volva seemed like they were badass witches. And I just want to like do something to go back in time and like roll with them for a couple years. <laughs> yeah, cool. That would be cool. You're like, I'm going to put on this time travel ring and I'm just going to go back there for a little bit. Right? So yeah. I'm sure there's more books that go into detail of them. But I did also see that people were saying that a lot of that history has been kind of a race you know because people don't want you to have the magic especially female power and things like that um so i think there's a book eric the red he's a viking right i think it's like a a book about him that has some of this magic in there as well nice stop trying to keep the female down exactly exactly so odin like learned a lot from them and people think that he could have been like the shaman of a town and even a real chieftain of this Asiatic tribe. They think he traveled all the way from Germany to Scandinavia. And in doing this like journey, he took the name Odin. He established this kingdom in Scandinavia with these new laws. He made the religion of the sun. And he just started like teaching people like how to make these buildings, what the arts were. And he kind of made it his mission to become a wisdom seeker and he ended up wanting to figure out what the language of the runes was mm-hmm. he's definitely known as as being someone who, who looks for knowledge to extremes he even is into like self-sacrifice like his the eye that he lost he sacrificed for wisdom in the legends wow oh my gosh that's intense yeah so he would do crazy st- shit to learn and the tale of how he got the runes is another crazy example of his like self-sacrifice legend. So apparently at the center of the Norse cosmos stands this tree. It's the Yggdrasil tree. It's like a giant ash tree. And in Norse cosmology, it connects the nine worlds. And so the roots and the branches hold the heaven and hell together. And it's this whole like mythical thing. And so Yggdrasil mm-hmm. grows out of this well I think it's pronounced the Well of Erd, U-R-D. And Mm -hmm. um, it's crazy that we're talking about wells again. I didn't plan this. (laughs) (laughs) And that the well waters are so deep that they're said to be um, holding powerful forces and beings and all the energy of these cosmos. And among these beings are the Norns, which are three wise maidens who create the fates of all beings. And this is why, again, threes are so powerful. A lot of people think that that's where Shakespeare got the idea to have those three witches in the cauldron. Mm-hmm. Is it Hamlet or Macbeth that that happens? Macbeth, right? Uh, Macbeth, I think. Yeah, yeah, so the idea of like the three fates kind of stems from this tale. And so Odin would like look down on them from Asgard and see them being powerful and using the runes because they would carve the runes on the Yggdrasil trunk and those symbols would carry their intentions and their magic throughout the tree and into the nine worlds. And so they were doing powerful, powerful magic and manifesting with these sigils and these runes. And so he decided he wanted to learn that power and the way he was going to do it was to prove himself worthy. So Odin did another self-sacrifice and he hung himself from a branch from the tree. Um, and he, Oh my gosh. Yeah, he went crazy. And then he pierced himself with his own spear and he peered down into the well for nine days in this state. 
And in this state, obviously, he was hungry. He was bleeding out. He was probably going in and out of the Wait, world. he was still alive? He's still alive, man. This is Odin here. And he's uh. going into this, like, shamanistic self-sacrifice state, you know, to get into a transcendental kind of zone. And he forbade any other person from helping him. He said, no other gods can help me. No sip of water, nothing. And so on the ninth night, he figured out and unlocked and was basically gained the knowledge of the runes. And the runes had accepted his sacrifice, like shown him the power, revealing to him all the symbols and all of their meaning. And so you can divine with the runes. You can use the runes as symbols to put on like weapons to protect them, make the warrior strong, put them on doorways to protect the home, use them to help people heal. They're very, very powerful. And I've just been using the runes to do divination and things like that. Right. But I just love the idea of Odin being so down to learn from all these wise women, including the three ladies in the well and the Volvos, just to get the knowledge of these runes. That's amazing. What an amazing story. I didn't know anything about him other than what he looks like, you know? Same. Ah. And I that's like barely getting into it because obviously the nine worlds and all that of right. Asgard and all that have to be super deep. <laughs> right. So that whole nine worlds thing is not mm-hmm. just in Odin's story. That nine worlds thing is like in the Bible. It's in all, oh. all religions. What? So I feel like that's in all religions. I've read little pieces of each religion pretty much and come up with with this nine worlds. And I, actually, I wouldn't have known about that had it not been for this um, Enochian magic stuff that I'm doing. But they... Oh. They also talk about, yeah, it's deep. So this, Mm -hmm. so Odin, if I'm thinking that angels are real, which I do, then I would have to believe in Odin too. Right? So, hmm, very cool. I I kind of want to contact him now. I want to be like, you're going on my list. (laughs) Dude, right? Like, I don't, self-sacrifice is scary, but he, he did so many amazing things, like, I also read that he had these magical tribes, like he was the head shaman, right? So he had these other shamans in his group, and he was known for doing these initiation rituals where he would uh, have these, I think it was like a set of nine caves, Uh and he would go through these caves, and whoever else was in the coven, basically, I'm going to say, although they wouldn't say that word, would uh, represent one of the astrological houses. So there were like 12 other guys in there, and you would pass them and kind of have to go through these tests and do these kind of different magical acts as you go through through the cave system and at the very end of the cave system it's said to like you go through this symbolic journey and at the very end you would face uh, maybe Odin wearing like a golden mask and when you look into the mask you see your own reflection and so the message is that like you are to know thyself yeah that and that's sense. so beautiful and deep mm-hmm. and like the magic is inside of you all along uh man this is the kind of stuff that they should be teaching to grade schoolers so that you know <laughs> We know it already by the time we're the age that we're at. Instead, we're just figuring out ourselves now. <laughs> right? Right? Oh, dang. And we I do it backwards. A, <laughs> I, I agree. Like, I need to get deeper into this. When I heard about this maze in this initiation, I got kind of hyped because I've heard about this. When I, I think I've even said it on podcast. I was talking to these local pagan groups that they were older. And I was like, oh, what do you guys do? Like, they have this area that you could drive out of town maybe 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And they said there was, like, a a labyrinth. And then I was hearing people say that there were rituals in the labyrinth. And I was like, well, what is it? And they're like, we can't tell you. That's kind of spoiling the surprise. So I was like, (gasps) was that, like, an initiation labyrinth magician thing? (laughs) So I was like, damn, I have to go. Side tangent. And another fun fact I just really have to share because I think this might be common knowledge, but to me it was new. But did you know that the Bluetooth symbol on our phones for Bluetooth is uh-huh. actually a it's combination actu- of two yeah. runes? Yes, I did actually know that. I didn't know that. And so yeah. I'm like so happy to see that. It's like yeah. supposed to be an H and a B mm-hmm. to represent this like Viking king. And so right. I feel like every day I have the power of the runes literally in my hands. <laughs> right, exactly. I guess I didn't realize that runes could heal. So mm-hmm. I was like, why don't we do that now? Mm-hmm. Do we, are there yeah. people out there, are there witches who use runes on a regular basis to heal themselves? So I would think so. I mean, I just knew that they were that you can use them as symbols. Like, I would think for protection. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are active vulvas in, like, Europe and stuff who really? are practicing. They have YouTube channels. I was watching them. 
it's great. <laughs> That's awesome. Man, my yeah. mind is just blown. You've learned so much just from studying Odin. <laughs> I know. It just opened a portal of just like this area I feel called to. I'm like, dang, I didn't know that you could be a shaman and be in, from German. I literally was so ignorant. I thought that all shamans were like Native American. Yeah, I thought so too. So <laughs> you know what? That's actually really cool. I mean, considering how deep our German roots go, mm-hmm. like, I mean, that's where we came from. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. wow. So I feel like this has to be in our blood, like I was saying. So I'm yeah. called to do this now. Can nice. we become bulbas? <laughs> we might be able to. We should look that up. <laughs> right? Let's go find out. <laughs> We're going to add that to our European tour. <laughs> oh, yeah. Done. Check. Check. Yeah. Check. Nice. So I feel like we should go on to uh, your topic. Yeah. So I am going to talk about Goddess Diana, but man, I don't know if I can follow Odin. You learned all this stuff and I have like two sentences really about Diana because I didn't know how much time I was going to get to speak about her. So I feel totally horrible. No! I'm not going to do her justice. <laughs> I would love to hear it because I know nothing really about her other than like the hunt, right? Go yeah. On. So she's the goddess of the hunt and the goddess of chastity and virginity. And I got to say that when I was reading into the mytho- the actual mythology of her, at first I was like, I'm completely confused. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. I'm in a way over my head <laughs> because mm-hmm. she's in two different um she's in two different ones roman and greek so she's in roman mythology greek mythology which kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier so if they're in more than one mythology in more than one place on in the world that we should think that they're probably the same so right what i found out is that in some cultures her name is artemis and some cultures her name is diana but they are the same and so I, I did. That. I didn't know that either. I thought that was pretty cool. And yeah, so that she's makes sense. right. Because kind of like with 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 the horned god, he's Cernanos, he's Pan, and those are the only two I could remember. But literally, the but, list is like ten other horned. Right. Things. So he's probably real, based right. on something. <laughs> yeah. Based on something. We can't, we weren't there, so we don't know. I mean, everybody could have been smoking the same pipe all over the United the world, not the United States, but all over the world. But it'd be weird. How did they get their information back and forth to each other? So. Anyways, she is considered to have these divine powers, and she's very celestial. So she wasn't from the earthly realm. She was from the godly realm. And how they explained her was that she had these two godly parents. So they were already in the celestial realm, and they gave birth to her and her twin brother, Apollo. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was pretty neat that she actually comes from the universe. She doesn't come from Earth. I like that too, and that really ties into the fact that you love doing exactly cosmos, cosmos kind of yeah. Mm-hmm. And so then, um, I guess I found out that she is worshipped typically in Wicca, neo paganism, and in in Stragaria, that old Italian witchcraft that we yeah. had talked about before. She's awesome. actually the queen of that religion. That's right. I think I remember reading about that a little bit. Yeah, so super cool. I did have one story that I kind of wanted to tell, just a little bit of a story. Um, So since she was the goddess of virginity and chastity and all of that, she vowed that she would never fall in love. So um, it's funny because in some stories that you read, it's like Diana and Artemis and this other one, they all agreed that they would never fall in love, but really all these characters are all the same, or not characters, all these names, they're all the same person. Mm-hmm. So, right. anyways, so she vowed that she would never fall in love. She used to travel from the from the higher up celestial realm to Earth quite often to kind of try to help out because she was the goddess of the hunt that she liked to she liked all of the animals here, so she felt kinship to them. So she wanted to make sure that she came to Earth because we provided Earth provides uh, nature, which she sometimes couldn't get from other places in the universe. Mm -hmm. So she came down here and she met the most beautiful man that she'd ever seen in her life. And his name was Orion. And right. She fell in love with him. They became friends. She they had many like picnics together. They had many walks together. They hunted together. They just became very close. 
Well, Apollo reminded her, re reminded Diana, or Artemis, however you want to call her, that she vowed that she would never fall in love and that she would never get married. And she just brushed him off. She's like, Apollo, that is not what's going on, even though deep in her heart she knew that she was in love with Orion. Stubborn. Right? Very stubborn. <laughs> and so Apollo went to Orion and tried talking to him and saying, hey, why are you hanging out with my sister Diana all the time? You know that she's not going to fall in love with you. And he said, no, I totally get that, even though he really loved her too. So they were really in love with each other, but they knew they could never really ever be together, but that didn't stop them from wanting to be together. And so Apollo started getting really angry. He was very protective of Diana and wanted to keep her on her path, whatever path that she was supposed to set or whatever path she was supposed to be on. And so he went to Diana and told her, there is an evil man in the town and he raped and killed a woman last night. And she just grabbed her bow and was like, let me at him. Because that was how she was. She would get really angry and then she would go kill or harm the person who caused the pain. And she was all for women's rights. She was all about protecting the woman. So as mm -hmm. soon as she found out that happened, she grabbed her bow, went out into the woods. And Apollo was with her and he said, there he is. And she shot the man and killed him. What she didn't know is that was Orion. Oh and so my she God. killed her lover. She was tricked to kill her lover. She immediately had ran, turned, flipped the body over, saw his face and was like, no, I just killed the love of my life. And she just cried and cried. And for days, she just held his dead body in her arms and cried and cried and cried. That's and so sad. right. So she buried him. And then to immortalize him, she created this, the constellation Orion to immortalize his memory. Oh, I'm all awesome. choked up right now. It's such an emotional story to think about how, if it were, if this really happened, how, how, what pain she went through and how her brother could do something so horrible to her. Yeah. I never yeah. knew anything about really Orion other than the constellation. Right. Same, same. But believe it or not, I have this little kid's book about it. That's kind of how I... I found it. I came across this little kid's book and told the whole story of, <laughs> of Diana and Orion falling in love. That's awesome. Yeah. So I don't really have anything else on her other than to say that she was kind of vengeful, I guess, that she wanted to be the goddess of the moon. So Luna, who was the goddess of the moon, she ended up kicking Luna off of the moon. And mm -hmm. pretty much throwing her off and barring her from ever coming to the moon so that she could be the celestial goddess. So sometimes you'll see goddess Diana represented as the moon. There's definitely a lot of moon goddesses. That could be a yes. whole episode too. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, so she can sometimes be represented by that. And it's just really interesting. A lot that I found out about her was that she was kind of violent. But I don't know right. if that violence started after Apollo, you know... It tricked her into killing her love, you know, right. or if she was always like that. And, you know, it's one of those things where, I, is it sexism? Because if this right. was like a man, it's like, oh, she's a strong warrior. Mm -hmm. But because she's a woman. Right. She's and, crazy. She's right. Violent. <laughs> exactly. I do know that the there sex? are. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say when you were describing her, like with the bow and like, yes. I'm going to go help this woman for women's rights. It kind of made me think of like Merida from Brave. Like, oh, yeah, I love I love the idea of a woman with a strong bow. Yeah, that's her. And I do know that there are um, statues all over Rome and and kind of the that area over there. For sure. Where, like she was definitely highly celebrated and probably still is today, like you said, in Italy. Right, right, in Italy. And so they represented her basically as a younger woman. So she's always seen as the ages is twelve to nineteen. When she was nineteen, I think, was when when she killed Orion. So that meant mm -hmm. that she probably didn't want to be on Earth anymore. So I think that between twelve and nineteen she was probably primarily here on Earth and then went back to the celestial realm to continue her reign up there. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what I was gathering from what I read. You know how you have to piece 
stuff together when it comes to mythology. You're like, oh, what is this? What does this mean? <laughs> right? It's almost so overwhelming, like you said, when you were trying to get into it. It's, like, convoluted. So right. I think I've purposefully been avoiding it my whole life. Like, sure. <laughs> yeah, because it's too much. There's and, so many characters. Right. And with her, too, I guess there's some statues. It was interesting that you mentioned with Odin about a three-headed statue. Was it him or... I think it's like about um, Hecate. Hecate, yes. So with Diana, there's also three-headed statues. Mm -hmm. Um, And at first, they thought that it was just to represent who she was. But then they started, there was a deeper dive into (laughs) the true meaning of it was probably mother, maiden, crone, all in one. Right. It's so beautiful. I love that. Right. And so hers was like a uh, dog, a dog, a deer, and a horse, I think. (gasps) Yeah. Really? Yeah. I don't know about horses because they're kind of scary, but I guess they're in the ride. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. deers and dogs, I'm real comfortable with. <laughs> but if she's the goddess of the hunt, it would make sense that she would have a horse. A horse. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. I love yeah. it. I, um, because I do work with like the horn god and mm-hmm. pan, I have like this really cool antler, like candle holder that I got mm. recently. Mm-hmm. And I have deers on my altar and nice. I'm down with horns. So like, honestly, I should get down with Diana too. Yeah, absolutely. So you inspired me as well. So you did great. Oh, thank you. I was a little bit worried. I was like, dang, you just got this great (laughs) stuff about Odin that makes me want to cry. It's so beautiful. (laughs) Yeah. And I feel like I barely understand him. Like I should definitely, oh, there's just so much. Yeah, so much. So I guess we had one more thing we wanted to kind of touch on today. Yeah. Is 13 Goals of a Witch by Scott Cunningham. So we have just enough time for that. Hopefully you guys aren't bored. Don't cut out yet. <laughs> Do you yes. want to start it off? Sure. The first is to know yourself. Know your craft. Learn. Apply knowledge with wisdom. Achieve balance. Keep your words in good order. Keep your thoughts in good order. Celebrate life. Attune with the cycles of earth. Breathe and eat correctly. Exercise the body. Meditate. Honor the god and the goddess. That was perfectly set up for you and I. Just so right? you know. <laughs> You're like, I'm a big meditator and I'm all about them gods and goddesses. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. I, I love it. Like, this definitely made me feel like being a witch was not bad when I learned about witchcraft. Yeah. Because cause... I still had those stigmas when I was new. And right. I was so afraid, but I was like, look at these goals, man. How could you say I'm bad? <laughs> right. Exactly. It's very beautiful. Do you know how he came up with this at all? I have no idea. This is something that I want to say is in the solitary guide, mm-hmm. the Wicca, the solitary guide for practitioner or whatever. Right. <laughs> I talk about it all the damn time. But um, like I said, it was just really comforting and really explained to me about gods and goddesses and what it really means. And like how I said, it helps me. It helps me yeah. find control of my life by doing these things, like knowing more about myself, who I am as a person, learning witchcraft is so powerful, and achieving balance is something I still work oh, for yeah. every day. Yeah, everybody wants to have balance in their life. Mm-hmm. And I feel like sometimes I achieve it. There, there are days when I can definitely tell I've really achieved it. Yeah, it makes a huge yeah. difference mm-hmm. in like, I feel like with people with anxiety, it does. Yes. Yeah. I also really like the idea of keeping your words and thoughts in good order because that's something that I think is important when you're manifesting and when you're trying to use the law of attraction to bring positivity and prosperity in order to like right. stop that negative self-doubt talk and negativity towards others. Right. You know how else I understood keep your words in good order? That you have to write your spell in a specific order. So that Ah. way you know that it comes true. So every time I read that, I'm like, oh, yeah, am I writing my spell in the correct manner? Mm, That's good advice. And for you, uh, what would you say would be the correct manner? Like making sure it's in the present tense, Mm -hmm. making sure that I'm asking for what I truly want Mm -hmm. and not asking for something I think I want. Mm, I like that. Um, What other ones would you say like pop out at you? Well, obviously meditate. Duh, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe not eating correctly so much, but breathing correctly. That's mm. a huge deal because that goes with meditation. And I, I'm just not, I just don't 
I, so many foods are out there that it's hard for me to say no when I have no self-control sometimes. So it's like if I see pie, I'm probably going to eat it. If I see some cake, I'm probably going to eat it. I think we both share a sweet tooth for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, it's like, to me, it's a great way to end the day, which is like the worst time to have sweets. But I'm like, ooh, yeah, a little bit of chocolate. Sometimes I like cookie. to have it for breakfast. Dude, when I came home from work before we recorded, I just ate a drumstick. I'm like, mm, that's my meal today. <laughs> like, not a chicken drumstick, but the ice cream. The drumstick. ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, that's it. Yeah. And you know yeah. what? That's what it is to be a witch. You're not perfect, but you strive to be a good person. Right. Exactly. <laughs> And I really like the attune with the cycles of the earth to really be in tune with earth. I know there I'm more attuned with the earth now than I probably ever have been. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like sometimes if I'm just sitting there meditating outside, especially at, like I like to do it at nighttime. Mm -hmm. So when nobody else is outside and you're just listening and you're feeling and I feel like at that time in that moment, I can feel and hear the earth. Yeah. And it's just so calming and so nurturing and and you just feel so much love for everything around you. Not to sound totally hippie-ish, but I guess I am. Totally. We're we're both from Oregon, <laughs> Oregonians. That's love right. Nature. Yeah. I totally am like I'm nodding my head like yeah. Yes. As you're saying <laughs> that. Because like I get bugged down by being in the office. I get bugged right. down by being indoors. Like I have to remind myself to go to the park. And usually when I do that, I feel so at peace. Right. Walking in the park is like meditation for me sometimes. Yes. And I, on occasion, have been known to hug a tree. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Like if you're trying to learn how to connect with energy, trees and plants are a great way. Like just like rest on the back of a tree, feel that energy. Yes. Yeah. But when I was when I first read Attune the Cycles with Earth, because I was reading this like Wiccan book and getting into Wicca at that time, I thought about like the Sabbaths and the Esbots and oh, like yeah. like this holiday we're talking about today and Samhain and Yule and Beltane. Mm -hmm. Like I just thought, Oh, that means you have to go celebrate all these holidays. Sure. And also be in tune with the moon cycles yeah. and celebrate your magic and celebrate the goddess based on the moon cycles. Nice. And you can just think of that in so many different ways about attuning with the cycles of Earth. So another thing I'm trying to work towards would be maybe get one of those planners that talks about the daily astrological alignments and what's going on. Oh, yeah. So I think that's another way to take that attunement goal. Right, right. We'll read yeah. about all that stuff. I love Being it. Be mindful what's going on, going mm -hmm. on in the universe. Yeah. There's a lot of, I, for me, I thought horoscopes and Zodiac and all that stuff was just like complete BS as a kid because everyone kind of mocks it. Sure. But it's not really. I like it a lot now. But now yeah. that I'm more spiritual and I kind of actually read into it, I'm like, oh, this this is fun. Like to, to see how the planets and the way they align can affect us. Right. And how even your birth can affect us. Because I know just for my own personal life, like being a Pisces is 100% is a accurate <laughs> for me. Right. Right. Same. So, All right. 13 goals. 13 goals. Very beautiful. What a great episode. I've had so much fun doing this one. This totally. was just such a such a moving episode for me i think it was really fun to just have like a free conversation about magic and yes. if you guys want to hear more episodes like this let us know it seems like our listeners love our witch episodes for sure yes i love our witch stuff I actually love i love too. all of our stuff though but right <laughs> i'm biased <laughs> but this one it's just it's like it's just growing my spirituality more and more every time i research it it Absolutely. helps me feel like i'm growing as a person so yeah keep these questions coming guys and if yes. there's any topics about witchcraft that you're interested in hearing our perspective on or our research on my cat is meowing in the background <laughs> <laughs> you're, but no not just your snow. cat it's your familiar <laughs> it's my little familiar he's like ow oh, i got some witch questions <laughs> <laughs> Where's my tuna? <laughs> exactly. He's hungry. <laughs> so thank you guys for listening and joining us in our virtual coven today. And you can join us next Wednesday where we're going to be discussing the mystery of the Mothman. But in the meantime, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at Cousins Coven. And check out our blog at CousinsCoven.home.blog 
where you can find witchy words of wisdoms, spells, and all of our archive podcast episodes from season one. Send in any research ideas, those witchy questions, any fan mail if you want to answer those questions back to us, your paranormal experiences, into CousinsCoven2 at gmail.com. We love to hear from you guys, so please like, share, subscribe with all your witchy and weirdo friends. And may you find happiness in your heart, love for yourself, and join each other. Blessings to all. Yay! Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs>